I won't remember that tomorrow. Okay. Let's get going. Seamus versus Randy Orton. Actually, you missed the opener because you weren't here, so I will explain. Then on the pre-show, they actually did a Wade Barrett versus Truth match where Truth's crown was on the line. If Truth... I'm sorry, Wade Barrett. Have I got this all fucked up already? No one cares about this, by the way. Wade Barrett put his crown on the line against the Truth. Now, if this were real, he'd throw the match. Because God forbid you do not want to have this fucking crown in WWE. Mm -hmm. But they had a wrestling match, and Wade Barrett won. And so Wade Barrett remains the king. And now I believe this feud is over. It was a very rather boring generic match. There was nothing wrong with it, but you miss nothing, Vinny. Nothing. Well, thank God we recap that. Well, we got to recap everything. It's, it's very important, otherwise people get upset, which we don't want. So we had Sheamus versus Randy Orton. Had a very long match, much longer than they would have on Raw, but wasn't especially good, which I believe just makes it a SmackDown match. It was, I thought it got pretty good there by the end. They were in St. Louis, which helped tremendously, and that they were mildly interested instead of just completely bored. The uh, biggest cheers of the entire uh, match, actually. Orton had a superplex. He had the draping DDT, and then for a good 30 or 40 seconds, he just stopped and posed in the ring. Mm -hmm. And that had everyone going nuts. And there's a lesson to be learned there. Do less. Do more, Do less and more posing. No one learned that lesson later on in the show, by the way. No, no, that is clear. There were a few themes throughout the show. And uh, doing less was not among them. So, towards the end, they started doing more big moves. Not too many, as we shall get to later. But Orton won with the RKO out of nowhere, which now is just one word. And the bell rang when the match was over. It was 25 minutes into the show. So, this match was near 20 minutes with, entr with entrances and everything. But... Longer is not always better, and this was just an opener. I actually thought it was better than your usual match. It it started out as a Raw match or a SmackDown match, but did enough at the end. The place was going crazy. Can't fault them for that. He had the RKO out of nowhere. When's the last time there was an RKO that was not out of nowhere? Uh, 2003? I don't know. When's the last time that Randy Orton set up an RKO and then hit it? And then won. Yeah. I would think it would be very rare. Far more rare than an RKO out of nowhere. He sets it up and he gets countered all the time. Now, I was very happy that they gave Randy Orton the win here in his hometown because after going to UFC 189, I have concluded that there is no instance ever where a babyface should not win in their hometown. <laughs> ever. It is quite ever, sad. Ever, 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 ever. I don't know where it began, this idea of let's beat the babyface in their hometown. So we'll get heat on the heel. I don't know where that... It, it probably began in WCW. Probably began with Ric Flair. Let's beat Flair in the Carolinas. We'll get heat on some heel. Now, if someone can go back... I should ask Dave. In fact, I'll ask him tonight. Maybe someone can find me an example where historically... Big money has been made... By beating babyfaces in their hometown. I would bet strongly... That it occurred sparingly... And only once. So, this trend that WWE had for about 15 years of every time someone's in their hometown, they got to get beaten. So, I mean, think about this. How many times has WWE come to a town? Twice a year? About that, yeah. Or unless you're in Seattle, they come once a year. Or maybe even less, depending on where you live in this country. So, you got a hometown babyface in Sioux City, South Dakota, who's going to come out and you're going to have a heel beat them. And you ain't going to fucking come back for a year or a year and a half. I highly doubt that anyone's going to remember. And if they do, I highly doubt that you're going to sell any extra tickets because you eat the fucking baby face in his hometown. So anyway, I'm glad this man won. This should be the headline of this week's figure four. Man wins in hometown. Thumbs up. We had Stephanie interviewed by JoJo backstage. Here was where Stephanie buried JoJo for being short. But hey. At least it's just the backstage interviewer. Well, to be fair, Stephanie buried herself for being tall. I see. She said, I feel like the big show. And then JoJo said something that I don't think she should have said because then Stephanie talked her down. Mm -hmm. JoJo said something like, yeah, I've heard that before or something. She said the wrong thing she, when Stephanie said she felt like the big show. JoJo replied with a, a, an honest, natural human reaction, which they hate. Yes. You must stick to the script and be wooden. 
No emotion, just robotics. You know what else I liked about Stephanie towering over her? Perhaps you'll recall back in the day when they had Andre the Giant. Mm-hmm. They wanted Andre to appear bigger, so they put him on a box. Right. There wasn't one box backstage they could have put JoJo on, so poor Stephanie wouldn't have felt awkward looking like the big show. No, they just threw her out there with little tiny JoJo and made her look like the big show. Looking like the big show is now a burial? When has looking like the big show not been a burial? I think in pro wrestling, looking like the big show is a good thing. Maybe the fact that he's tall, but it's not like he's an Adonis. I don't think she meant that she was bald. <laughs> Fat. Big boned, at least. I see. That's yeah. your first reaction on seeing the big show. Look at that fat guy, and oh, by the way, he's seven feet tall. Yeah, actually. Okay. He's very rotund. Okay. Steph, for the record, mentioned the St. Louis wrestling tradition, including Sam Muchnick's wrestling at the chase. Yeah. She's got a big pop. New Day versus primetime players. He didn't even say what she said. She had an announcement. Well, she announced there would be a three-way later with one woman from each of the new teams she has made. And she promised they would tear the house down. That's right. The playground teacher is assigning a playground game for later. That's what this was. It's pretty accurate, actually. New Day versus primetime players. The stars of this were the New Day, especially uh, Xavier, but basically whenever they were talking. he come out cutting a wacky promo about how they're going to reap what they had sown. And then Big E made a reaping motion and explained, this is me reaping. <laughs> He's a good reaper. He's a great reaper. I've never reaped as that well. Then You've never reaped. I mean, I, that's true. I am reapless. They then announced that they deserved to win. And I can't argue with this. Everybody cheered. Yeah. So they were working over Darren Young in the corner. Xavier was throwing out stra sound strategic tips such as punch him in the abdomen. <laughs> He's a smart guy, Vinny. He also... Uh, no, I'm not knocking him. Yes. Do you know how boring this would have been without Xavier? Uh, every one of these matches would be boring without Xavier. That's true. He also referenced Big E's tricep meat. Yeah. Not mm -hmm. his tricep muscle, tricep meat. Well, it's very meaty. Mm -hmm. And there is a lot of meat over the muscle. Yep. So uh, Darren made his own comeback, including giving Xavier the first of about 400 bumps onto the apron on this show. That's right. Many, many apron bumps on this show. Mm -hmm. Titus made a comeback, which was uh, much less sloppy and out of control than usual. And finally, Darren had a gut buster, and Titus pinned Biggie with a spine buster. So no, the New Day did not get the win they deserved, but it was a fun little tag match. I was baffled they didn't give the New Day the win. I mean, he's been father of the year for months now. Can we move on? There are other fathers here. Maybe they're waiting for him to have another kid. So yes, they, they had a fun little match. Xavier's the best cheerleader ever. Actually, he's not. Let's be honest. There are many, many better cheerleaders than Xavier. But as far as male cheerleaders, there's no one better. And don't know what else to say, except I just still can't believe that the New Day is not the champions. Maybe they'll win them on Raw tomorrow. You That's never, possible, you right? Never, you never know. Anything can happen, they like to say. That is true. Anything can happen. Also, Xavier was working harder than anybody in the match. Oh, for sure. Yes. <laughs> on his team or the others. It's funny because I was thinking during the match, it's like, this guy's such a good cheerleader. They never make him work. What a lucky guy. He's always on the outside not doing any wrestling. And then, after about five minutes, it was like, I think I'd probably rather be in the ring. <laughs> this man is fucking burning some calories out here. Paige did a promo with Charlotte and Becky backstage. God, this annoyed me. Becky said they were putting the divas on notice. They were even putting the superstars on notice. Yes, they can no longer say women and men. No. They can only say divas and superstars. Unless you're that uh, that skinny... Who is that fucker? The guy that got powerbombed by Kevin Owens? The rapper? Yeah. Oh, yeah, he's not a superstar. He's not a superstar. Machine Gun Kelly? Machine Gun Kelly, that's right. He's uh, just a fella. He is not a superstar, they said. He's shaped like a machine gun. I think that's where he got his name. Anyway, these women here, they promised to tear the house down. You mean down. these divas? Yeah. They promised to tear the house down. They said they would do it with flair, and then, so help me God, they did a triple pinky swear. Yeah. This was your usual WWE scripted nonsense. Yeah. Roman Reigns versus Bray Wyatt. This was weird. Yeah. So, first of all, from the get-go, Cole lets us know, Roman Reigns has not pinned or submitted anyone 
since Bray Wyatt screwed him in that ladder match. <laughs> Letting you, the viewer, know that Roman is, in fact, a loser. Listen, I'm not going to give up on my tirade regarding Roman Reigns, but when they were pushing Roman Reigns really hard and he never lost, and the people were turning on him, I had to listen to all these people say, this is a bad idea to never to push him as Superman. You've got to you've got to make him sympathetic. Have him lose here and there and and the people will like him more. Okay. Here we are in July. He's at a significantly lower level than he was 6 months ago. There was a little bit of heat for this match, but this guy is a mid-carder. He's no longer a main eventer. I mean, maybe, maybe there are people out there that think Roman Reigns is hotter than ever, but he's not. And with each successive loss, he's more of a mid-carder. So now their plan at SummerSlam will be to try to rehab him by linking him with Sting. All it's going to do is make him look like a less charismatic superstar than Sting, because Sting's loaded with charisma and will be beloved. This is just not working. They've, they've, they've lost their way with Roman Reigns. They fucked it up. So, it's usually, you know, a, fa a crowd either likes a guy or doesn't like a guy or in a worst case scenario doesn't care about a guy. The, their approval of Roman Reigns and their approval of Bray Wyatt changed constantly throughout this match. Yes. Sometimes they liked Roman. Sometimes they liked Bray. Sometimes they just booed whoever was winning. So it wasn't a terrible match or anything, but it was pretty boring. Bray beat him up for a long, long time. They a did, long time. They did power bombs. They did DDTs off the apron. They did mounted punches in the corner. Chin locks. And then after all of that, Bray went to a long, long chin lock spot. And no one cared. Roman made a comeback using these big crotch lift suplexes that nobody else does anymore. Crowd inexplicably began to chant this was awesome when it was not. They brought on the floor, and I wrote, this is showing no signs of building to a conclusion, and then Roman began to throw chairs in the ring. And I was horrified they would do a DQ and then a rematch, because this was nothing I ever wanted to see again. <laughs> you can see something like it again. Yes, I, I am. And then as the ref was throwing the chairs out of the ring, Roman was attacked by, as Michael Cole said, some guy in a hoodie. And he beat Roman up and threw him in, and uh, Bray hit Sister Abigail and won. And the hoodie I got in the ring, he pulled off his hoodie. It was Luke Harper, to which JBL replied with his exact tone of voice. The family is back together. <laughs> I He had to have been asleep. He had to have been asleep. You were asleep. practically asleep. I was more awake than he was. So let's review this match in a nutshell. Bray Wyatt broke no rules, fought courageously, and was winning for 80% of the match. At the end... Roman was getting his ass kicked, tried to cheat, and a third party intervened to ensure that justice was served. No wonder Roman got booed. That was the lesson of this night. There is one heel in this entire company, which we'll get to. But there was no reason to boo Bray Wyatt. He's not a heel. He's just a guy. He is just a guy. That's the problem. Mm -hmm. He's just a guy. Roman Reigns is just a guy. Now, with all that said, I thought this was actually a pretty good match. It did go too long. Ah. Uh. This did not need to go. I think it went 21 minutes. This would have been significantly better at 15 minutes. But they lost a match, which was the three-way for the Intercontinental title. And so instead of adding another match, they just stretched all of the matches out. And some of these matches, they don't need to be longer. And this was one of them. But for, for what they did, they tried really hard. The fans were more into it than I expected. So I will give this one thumb up. It's a pretty good match. And it is, in fact, leading to Roman Reigns and Sting against the Wyatt family at SummerSlam. So, again, that's uh, their idea. We link Roman Reigns with Sting, and maybe he'll get over. Completely forgetting that the easiest way to get a guy over, and it's been like this forever, and it will never change, is for him to not lose. <laughs> and so their fucking brilliant idea is to beat him and then put him with a more charismatic guy. We'll see how that goes. Let's just put it that way. I'm skeptical. We'll see how it goes. I'm always skeptical, but I got faith. Actually, I don't. <laughs> I pretend like I have faith so I can be unbiased. JoJo interviewed Team Bad. I'm bad. Which stands for Beautiful and Dangerous. 
And Naomi said, uh, Tamina is the muscle. I am the razzle dazzle. And Sasha is the champ. And Sasha said that she was the boss, which led me to think, shouldn't you be doing the talking then? No. Which, by the way, brings us to this three way where the match was Sasha versus Charlotte versus Brie. Mm -hmm. Now, where to begin? I'm going to be very, very, very critical of a lot of things they did here. But I will start by being positive and say that they did give them more time than usual. And they did not put them in the death spot. Fact and fact. So from that perspective, they tried harder than usual. Now, with that said, Sasha, Charlotte, and Brie had a three-way. Sasha came out to Naomi's music. Charlotte came out to Paige's music. And the Bellas were presented as the main eventers and came out to Nikki Bella's music. God bless Brie Bella. Daniel Bryan is a really smart, really nice guy. And Brie Bella seems like a really sweet girl. And I don't picture Daniel Bryan hooking up and marrying a girl who's like a complete idiot or anything like that. So I think she's probably really, really nice. I feel bad saying anything bad about her. But with that said, she stuck out like a sore thumb in this match. Mm -hmm. Here's the deal. A revolution is supposed to be beginning. And so if you want a revolution to begin, what you should have done is booked a singles match with Sasha and Becky Lynch. I don't know how you want to set it up since you're doing this stupid Nation of Domination team gimmick. I mean, maybe Mother Hen could have come out with a bunch of fucking straws and you all pulled straws. And the two people that pulled the shortest straws or the longest straws or whatever the fuck were Sasha and, and Becky Lynch. And the two of them could have gone out there and torn the house down. But instead, it's Raw. It's WWE, It's a main roster. So they decide we got to do a three-way with one girl from each team. Charlotte is, is very, very athletic. But she's not yet like a great worker. And Brie is just not the right girl to do this kind of match with these girls. It was better than your normal horrible Raw women's match. But it was not a blow away match. It did not tear the house down. There were pockets of fans that really, really wanted this to be great. We had chance for the NXT girls. We want Becky, NXT, and that sort of thing. But at the end of the day, the vast majority of the crowd, because of everything that I just mentioned, saw this as just another three-way women's match on pay-per-view. And they were barely into it. Now, I will say... Thank God Brie got pinned or submitted or whatever the hell happened. Yes. I thought for sure that Brie was going to win this match. I, I would have bet money on it. <laughs> Thank God they didn't do that. So there were three things that they had going for them that they really, really tried, and they give me a modicum of hope. But the rest of this whole presentation, this was not NXT. This was WWE where they tried a little bit harder. And knowing how quickly Vince changes his mind on everything... This was not a home run at all. No. And the other thing is that the idea, I know what they would say. They would say no one would accept this if we just put, for example, Becky and Sasha or Becky and Charlotte or Charlotte. They may as well give up then. Yeah. They say we had to put a star in there so people would care. And the whole point that people who are watching this team and screaming is if you give these women a chance, they will be stars. Give them 20 minutes to do a 20-minute match. They'll be stars in one show. But no, they decided this match would be better with Brie Bella in it. For a while, I was getting irrationally angry about this. Because as you noted, she is so not at the level of the other two. She's doing these horrible go-behinds. She got thrown out of the ring. I was very happy. Then she came back and my blood started to boil. And I settled down and she was mostly okay. She was trying. Yeah. But it was sad because every time she got in the ring... It the whole, was here's not the whole point. heel the, booing. The reason you're doing a revolution angle is because the fans are, in fact, sick of your current top, well, the whole roster that you've, that you've been putting out there for the past several years. They're sick of the Bellas. They're sick of Brie Bella. So whenever Brie went on any offense at all, it was go away heat. Yes. It was, oh, fuck. 
It was not boo like we don't like you heels. It was get the fuck out of the ring. I paid for this show. Get out of the goddamn ring. I'm getting ang- irrationally angry again about this. It's not her fault. It's really not. The At only, all. The only thing it's about this fault. was whoever, whoever thought of the spot where Bree would grab one woman in a headlock and hit a double bulldog. That looked dumb. So, yes, Sasha had the Banks statement on Charlotte, but Brie broke that up, which is where everyone figured Brie would pin Charlotte, but then instead Charlotte put it in the figure eight for the submission win. And Charlotte and her friends had a tremendous celebration. That was great. The match was much better than most WWE women's matches. It was an above average WWE match. Women's match. Yeah, it was... It was, it, this would have been better than most matches on a typical episode of Raw. Okay. Right. Kevin Owens versus John Cena. I just started copying and pasting. Cena hit insert move here for a near fall. Owens hit, hit insert move here for a near fall. I used the phrase for a near fall a dozen times in this report. That's funny. Is the first time they had a match. I thought it was awesome. Mm-hmm. I thought their first match was awesome. And there were a few people that were down on it saying they just kicked out of each other's moves all the time. Now, I don't know what it was. Maybe I got to go back and watch it again. But that match didn't feel like they're just kicking out of each other's moves. No. It felt like a match. And maybe it was because it was the first one. I specifically mentioned it was a non-formula match where they didn't just kick out of each other's big moves and then lay there over and over again. The second one was, although it was still pretty good, this one was to the point of self-parody. Yeah, it was. I mean, if this I don't know how long this match was. Let's say it was 20 minutes. Mm-hmm. It was five minutes before there was the first kick out of an AA. You're, five well, minutes! Yeah, yeah. Two minutes in, Owens used a torture rack neckbreaker for a near fall. Yeah. It was, I, I thought I had fallen asleep and missed 10 minutes of the match. <laughs> no, they just immediately they decided we're going to wrestle for three minutes, and then we're going to do 1,000 near falls. We will kick out of everything. Yes. So, listen, the place was going ballistic. It was a great match. St. Louis loved this match. But it was the weakest of the three. Yeah, it was the best match on the show. I will say that. But it was just the same thing over and over and over and over again. Owens did a small package for a near fall, which I thought would have been the best finish in the world. And they they did save the pop-up powerbomb forever, and I figured that would be the end. But no, that was just a near fall. And then finally, Cena hit the AA and hooked the STF, and Owens tapped out. Yeah. So, Owens is a quitter. Cena's U.S. champ. This is not my favorite match in the world. I thought it was a very good match. I, I just decided, this, this, this is one of those moments where I said, you know what? I am old, and wrestling has passed me by. Well, it was a third match. It was the last one. They decided they were going to pull out all the stops. It's what they do. And hey, listen, you are old if you can't appreciate the fact that whether it was... A great match, a good match, a spot fest match. It was the best match on the show, and the place was going crazy for the whole thing. Those last two statements are both facts. I've seen plenty of matches where people kick out of a thousand moves and nobody gives a shit. That's true. So, whatever they did, the people loved it, and it worked for the night. Yeah. Now, the big thing everybody's talking about is the fact that Kevin Owens tapped out. Now, I got two things to say, which are actually completely the opposite. So I'm just going to say them both. I told you all. I told you, and I will tell you again. I'm telling Kevin Owens if he's listening. You can't be so fat. Vince is still in charge. He's 70. You ain't going to teach an old dog new tricks. You're not going to convince him that a really, really fat guy or a really, really skinny guy or a really, really short guy or a guy that does not look like John Cena, The Rock, Hulk Hogan, Bruno San Martino even wasn't even uh, Vince Jr.'s guy. But look at all of the guys that Vince has chosen as his top guys. And granted, there have been guys like Yokozuna and there have been other fat guys that have gotten a run. But as far as like a consistent, top, long-term main eventer who rarely loses. They're almost never fat. Kevin Owens came in. He was in much better shape than he is right now, I think. Maybe I'm imagining things. 
But it seemed to me that like he trimmed down a lot. And here he is, and he's getting heavy again. And he's got a farmer's tan, and they did some... I can't remember what it was. It was Comic-Con or something like that. And every single guy there was in a suit, except if I recall correctly, Kevin Owens was in a, t a sleeveless t-shirt. He's wearing a shirt. And... It's just playing with fire. It's just playing with fire. Now, maybe I'm reading too much into this, everybody. I admit, maybe I'm reading too much into this, okay? Because they did give the guy everything. That he kicked out of all sorts of moves, including a top rope AA. They gave him every single solitary thing they could before they made him submit. However, they very, very easily could have done a finish where... Cesaro and Rusev, who had U.S. title matches for a full month, and Kevin Owens ran in on every single one of them. They could very easily have done a finish where he ran in in this match. Both of those guys, Rusev or Cesaro or both, ran in and cost Kevin Owens a match. And so neither of these men would lose. And you go to SummerSlam and you do a four-way for the U.S. title. And Kevin Owens pins Rusev, for example. Kevin Owens becomes the U.S. champion. He didn't get pinned here by John Cena. He didn't pin John Cena. The feud's over. Everybody moves on. They very, very easily could have done something like that to protect Kevin Owens. But they didn't. They beat him clean in the middle of the ring via tap-out submission. So maybe I'm a conspiracy theorist here. Maybe I'm thinking way too much into this. But looking historically. Looking historically. I just think that Kevin Owens pushed his luck and a message was sent here to him in this match. Maybe I'm wrong, but that's what I think. My other takeaway from this is, like with Bray Wyatt, why was Kevin Owens a heel here? Aside from saying some mean things to Michael Cole, which makes him a baby face in my mind, what did he do that was evil or cowardly or, disrespect or dis uh, disrespectable? He was just a guy. No reason to cheer for him, no reason to boo him. Hell of a match, though. Best, it was the best match in the show. <laughs> Trying to be happy and positive here. Miz came out, got a promo on Ryback for getting staph infection and backing out of their match. He called Ryback a big pansy. He claimed Ryback got hurt all the time. He also said Big Show had been missing since the Attitude Era and should retire. He vowed to take the title, the U.S. title, back to Los Angeles, a real city that was going to take back the Rams. Everyone in St. Louis booed. So Big Show comes out to interrupt. I'm not sure if this counts as a face turn or not for those of you keeping score. But Miz began to suck up to him, said they should team up again, and Show punched him out, and he left. And that was the whole segment. He wanted them to form a team. I forget what he wanted to call it. Show Miz. <laughs> That's right, Show Miz. Yeah. Where the hell did I write that down? Oh, there it is, Show Miz. And then people cheered Show, as noted. So yes, that may have been turn number 35. I'm not positive. Main event was Seth Rollins versus Brock Lesnar. And he said that uh, Rollins was out there with no friends and no family. That's right. Apparently, Brock ate his parents. Hey, Brock, you know, wouldn't it be cool if Brock were Dario Cueto's brother? Yes. It'll never happen. Yes, it would. I hadn't thought of that, but yes, it would. It's one of the rare guys in this business <laughs> that that would be an acceptable payoff. God damn it. Now, whatever they do is not going to live up to that. Dude, nothing could ever live up to it. There's literally only one man, and that's Brock Lesnar. And it ain't going to be him. He's got to work out some kind of deal. I don't think it's going to happen. I don't either, it. but <laughs> it's got to be something that can be done. I mean, hey, can't they? I think the Lucha Underground should approach WWE and say, listen, we're not competition. We're a TV show. We want to hire Brock to be an actor on our television show. That's what right. do you think? That's right. So Seth Rollins was the only heel in the show who was actually a heel. He tried to run away. Unfortunately, as we noted, Brock is fast and ran him down, hurtling the railing to get, get to him and throw him back into the ring. Seth was terrified. He was stalling for time, doing his best to uh, escape uh, Brock's wrath. Whenever he would be fortunate enough to escape an F5 or a suplex, he would hit a flurry of kicks and then almost immediately be cut off again. He knocked him out of the ring. Hit a pair of topes where he tried a third. Brock was so fast, he zoomed into the ring and cut him off and hit a belly to belly. That was awesome. That was very awesome. Brock is amazing, everyone. He did a bunch more suplexes. 
And JBL, I knocked him earlier, but I will say he had the best booking idea ever here. Somebody needs to tap out after a suplex. KO via suplex. Has to happen. Dude, I think that was the idea that they had. They kind of had that idea for Brock when he first uh, debuted. He's gonna he's gonna beat everybody by he was just gonna kill him and and win by uh by ref stoppage. That was the great that'd be a great idea too. Oh, yeah. Via suplex. Thirteen suplexes. I think that's what they counted here. And in what was not a very long match. No, the the audience counted along for all of them, so we got the audience screaming thirteen at one point. Seth bumping all over the place like a fish. Yeah, and, and Heyman's on the outside, and at one point he yelled something like, That's nine! <laughs> and as soon as I heard that, I thought, what if they went to the back and they just said, all right, Seth, I'm going to take 13 suplexes. Can you do that? Yeah, yeah, I guess. And so that's was Heyman counting for him. <laughs> We're at nine, buddy. That's entirely possible. <laughs> There's four more. I'm almost home. Almost home. They actually were, were all relatively safe suplexes. No, there's no high angle bumps or anything. No, the worst. Actually, you know what the worst bump of the night was? When, when John Cena finally took the pop-up power bomb. His fucking head bounced off that mat. That looked like it sucked. The other one, they did a spot where Brie got knocked off the apron and her partners were supposed to catch her. Oh, yeah, they missed her completely. They, well, they sort of did because for a while she was going upside down backwards towards the floor and they were able to slow her down at least. Yes. But they did not catch her in any sense of the word. <laughs> well, they caught her. Yes. They, they, but she literally went ass over tea kettle. Literally. There was a tea kettle out there and it was below her ass. Yeah. Yeah. So finally, Brock hits, as you noted, 13 suplex and sex, suplexes. Sue sexes? I think I almost said that. And then he decided, well, I'm done. And he hits an F5, and he makes a cover. Then the lights go out, and we hear the Undertaker's dong. And St. Louis loved this. Oh, yeah. It was a kind of amazing. Because they had loved Brock Lesnar all night long. Nonstop. Without, without, uh... I know. Every, every moment of it, they loved. And it was unanimous. Yes. No one didn't like Brock. No one no one liked Seth. There were no fucking dueling chants. No. It was all Brock. Because Seth is a heel, you see. But then when Taker showed up, everyone changed their minds. Yeah. I heard about four guys still chanting Suplex City, but they were in the minority. They were the minority, in fact. They may have been chanting that for Undertaker. I hadn't thought of that. So Brock looked like he had seen a ghost. Fucking had. Did you see the Undertaker? <laughs> And Taker grabbed him for a choke slam, but Brock escaped that. And then Taker avoided an F5. He kicked Brock in the balls. And he very, very gradually hit a choke slam. And then took his time, let it sink in, hit a tombstone. The place was just pissing themselves with glee. And he started to leave, but Brock began to stir. So Taker returned to tombstone to begin. And then Taker's light show started, and he hit his pose, and his music played, and the show went off the air with no finish to the pay-per-view main event world championship match. You know what was interesting about this was we did Observer Live today, and we did the two-hour preview show, and so we're thinking about all these scenarios for this match. And there were two possibilities going in. One, Brock just won the title, or two, somebody got involved. And I'd heard all sorts of ideas. Maybe the Shield will reunite, for example. And there'd been a lot of talk about Undertaker. And I just couldn't figure out what the fuck can you possibly do with The Undertaker? Because The Undertaker's old and he's not going to be booed. And Brock Lesnar is the biggest babyface in the company. So you're really going to turn him heel for a feud with The Undertaker? It would just, I, I, I couldn't wrap my head around what they could possibly do. But I figured if Undertaker came back, what would happen was. Brock would take 100% of the match, hit the F5, the dong would hit, Undertaker would come out, and the rest is history. And it's exactly what happened, except Seth got 5% of the match. So I was wrong by 5%. But when the Undertaker came out here, this place went crazy. They went absolutely crazy. And all I could think was, you know what would have been even better, which probably would have got even a much, much bigger reaction? is if they hadn't done that goddamn feud with Bray Wyatt and uh -huh. not had Undertaker work at WrestleMania. Uh -huh. If Brock Lesnar would have killed The Undertaker at WrestleMania and ended the streak, and we never saw The Undertaker again, he was not seen from, he was not heard from. And all of a sudden, in this middle, in the middle of this match, Brock hits the F5 and that dong hit, that would have been un... 
I mean, this was already unbelievable. But it would have been significantly more unbelievable if we hadn't even seen the guy. Because now it's kind of like, why is Undertaker mad now? Yes, that's the, that's my thought. Where was he at WrestleMania when he was just upset at Bray Wyatt? Why wasn't he mad at Brock? I thought For crying he, out loud, Brock's a babyface. Now he was a heel at WrestleMania. I thought he had moved on. Yeah. He had put the loss behind him and gone on with his own life. Yeah. But anyway, he came back and, and he did his deal. And so now, here's where I think they're going to go. I could be wrong. I think that they do Undertaker versus Brock Lesnar at SummerSlam in a singles match. And I think that Brock Lesnar beats him again. Because Undertaker beat the shit out of him here. Two tombstones and a choke slam and left him laying. So I think that Brock is going to beat him at SummerSlam. So it's two in a row for Brock. I think Undertaker will disappear again. And I think that around the time of the Rumble or or Fast Lane or whatever the fuck the stupid pay-per-view is called that they replace Elimination Chamber with, I think the Undertaker comes back and he just says, Listen, it's Texas Stadium. This will be my last match ever. You've beaten me twice. I want one more shot. At WrestleMania. You do the third match. You could probably close the show with it. Depending on how good SummerSlam is. You may not want to. And Undertaker in his retirement match. Beats Brock Lesnar. In the middle of the ring at WrestleMania. And avenges his losses. And goes off into the sunset. I think that's the best way to do it. I don't think that Undertaker should beat him at SummerSlam. I think that's a bad idea. Why stop the momentum? I have no idea. No. Um, that's a, That's a great story to tell. It's the perfect place to do it, and Lord knows they need something special to fill that cavern. That's right. That moth, that giant, giant building. So there's your SummerSlam card, it looks like. You've got Undertaker and Brock Lesnar, I hope. And you've got Roman Reigns and Sting versus the Wyatt clan. I have absolutely no idea now what you do with Seth Rollins. <laughs> I have no idea who he's going to be facing. Who does he face? At SummerSlam? Yeah. Let's see, who won on the show? Not that it matters. Are they going to do a goofy tournament tomorrow? Not that it matters, but let's pretend winning and losing on the show would set up a challenger. Uh, Cena? We could do a title versus title match. Mm -hmm. Charlotte? I don't think that's happening. Uh, Bray? That's Um, right, Bray did win. Except he's doing the tag match. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Orton. Actually, Orton would make sense. Could be Randy Orton. Yeah, Orton's probably the best answer. Could be Randy Orton. Unless there's someone obvious I'm missing that has not been on the show. But uh, Orton is a guy who... He has history with Seth. He beat him at Mania, never got a rematch for that. I still don't think after he lost the title without being pinned, I don't think he ever got his one-on-one rematch. That's right. So Orton versus uh, Seth actually makes a ton of sense. How about that? We just fantasy booked a SummerSlam show. Mm -hmm. So that was the show, everybody. Overall, I thought it was a, I would go as far as to say it was a thumbs-up show. Yeah, no, I agree. Thumbs up show. Despite everything we complained about, there was there were good there was good wrestling for the most part. The Undertaker thing, I know some people didn't like it, but it's about the fans. It's about the people in the building and the people buying the WWE network. And I'm sure traffic for our website right now is through the roof because The Undertaker came back and... You sound like you're almost bitching about that. <laughs> Brock Lesnar. All these goddamn customers. Well, you know, when the site goes down, I do get upset about that. I but see. Hasn't gone down. Site used to go down all the time. And it has not gone down a single time except I think there was a Ronda Rousey fight may have brought it down. Or something like that. But anyway, that was the show.